Hello everyone, my name is Niall Murphy and the title of this talk is What if the promise of AI ops were true? First thing to say is I'm going to begin with acknowledgements. This talk, I rely on previous talks and various written materials from Todd Underwood, Steve Ross, Daniel Fisher and many other thinkers in the AI ops space uh, whose thoughts I plundered uh, for this talk. Let's start off with a few definitions. First thing to say is AI, artificial intelligence. Okay, fine. Uh, the activity of mimicking human behavior, understanding, uh, representation outcomes, really, uh, using artificial means. ML, machine learning, is the primary method by which we achieve this today in kind of contemporary computing and is obviously revolutionizing the world, computing and uh, ourselves, probably in that order. Important to make the following distinction, ML ops is the emerging term for the act of running machine learning infrastructure on kind of a, a production basis. And AI ops is running production infrastructure with AI, which is often actually approximated uh, to be ML. So if ML ops and ops ML, um, so on and so forth, it can be very confusing, but those are the terms as I understand them uh, from a, I, I suppose, a, a textual definition point of view. I think as we'll see more evidence for throughout this talk, actually the use definition of AI ops is less concentrated in the running production infrastructure with AI or or ML uh, domain, and it's kind of more like a general assertion that actually big data applies to production too, you know, and you can do useful things with this. So let's begin with some uh, clam chatter or claim chatter, uh, which is a phrase I think attributed to John Gruber of Daring Fireball. Uh, this is a game you can play with a lot of things. Uh, I have chosen in this slide to play it with AI ops, and here are the results. Uh, if you go looking, you can find a lot of people saying a lot of, I suppose, grandiose things about AI ops. Uh, quote, most experts consider AI ops for the future of IT operations management. This is from IBM. Uh, the IBM cloud, I think, has some connection with Watson uh, or cross-selling opportunity there. Uh, so perhaps not surprising that we would see something like this. Gartner says there is no future of IT operations that does not include AI ops. It's from Science Logic. Okay, uh, we will compensate for the multiple negations, and we understand what you mean, Gartner. Uh, I also looked at Wikipedia, where we have the phrase AI ops can be viewed as CICD for core IT functions, which is interesting because I thought CICD could be viewed as CICD for core IT functions, but fine. Uh, a wonderful uh, paragraph or set of sentences from uh, a article in Data Economy suggests there's another type of AI an algorithmic approach to intelligence, okay, uh, that is smart and is emerging as the type of AI that IT organizations of all types could start implementing soon. And there's nothing artificial about it. Well, I think there's probably something which is quite artificial about artificial intelligence. And even if you mean there's nothing artificial in the sense of made up or shouldn't exist or similar, uh, I also think you could debate that. Interesting paragraph here from devops.com, uh, noting that developers, presumably product developers in this case, one of the fears here is that, you know, when you touch the pager, you own the pager, you're opening yourself up to a constant stream of irrelevant alerts. It's interesting that in this paragraph, old ops hands, uh, yes, of course, they have experience of this but they share a personal approach to filtering the noise, which is interesting because it suggests that a centralized approach to filtering the noise and improving the alerts 
can't work or isn't on the table somehow. And as a result, AI ops ensures, according to this paragraph, that only valid and actionable alerts get as far as being shown to a human being taking up their valuable time. Actually, like slight issue with the the core point in the paragraph, I would say that like maybe AI ops could do this, um, sure, but also so could tuning your alerts. And also from uh, the new stack, today with AI ops, you can automate monitoring and correlation of activities in the data pipeline and uncover the myriad issues that can arise. Uh, I think I would probably take issue with the statement that you can automate monitoring right now. That seems not, not something which is in scope. And I agree you can correlate activities uh, with machine learning and AI and so on. Uh, any kind of metric stream can be, can be joined. Don't necessarily need ML or AI ops to do that. Yeah, but I, I agree that in certain cases, they can make this easier. So I, I think when I look at the industry discussion of what AI ops could do for us or to us, possibly, there seems to be a bit of dichotomy between the CIO level and the individual practitioner level, maybe even team lead, et cetera. There's very definitely a different way of looking at it. And so my experience is the CIO level material that's out there that I see out there is to a certain extent, maybe saying the quiet bit out loud. And so these paragraphs from CIO.com uh, under a section called digital advisor are I think pretty illustrative in this respect. It focuses, as you can see, on the question of whether or not traditional IT, well, it, it has become overwhelmed by data, according to this paragraph, to function under traditional management. And so AI ops opens the door to a, a brighter future. What is that brighter future? Well, it allows us to do kind of swift cross silo data gathering and saves time and all of that wonderful stuff. With the brighter future, in, in some extent, also being that you can get engineers that you don't have to pay for which is obviously good, or possibly let go of existing engineers that you do have to pay for, which is maybe less good. Uh, anyway, the basic deal here is it's interesting the extent to which under traditional management is the key bit which is delivered by AI ops. You don't need to change your traditional management, even though you've become overwhelmed with data because the cross silo stuff can happen enabled by software, even if the management can't make it happen. And I find that very interesting because actually theoretically you could in fact spend you know, time and attention on your culture, get cross silo stuff working, have people talk to each other and other revolutionary ideas, but instead you could spend some money on software and have that problem all go away or equivalent. And that is one of the promises of AI ops. And so when you think about it that way, there's actually kind of opposing positions uh, about AI ops, which are emerging. Um, like I'll, I'll say there's, there's three, but uh, uh, probably two arguably, right? Uh, first one is in, in honor of ex colleague Todd Underwood and Stephen Ross, I will call the Underwood Ross stance. And this is, as per their talks at SRE cons in the past. And here, this is essentially, this position essentially states that AI ops or you know, ML for operations doesn't really make much sense. And it doesn't really make much sense for a bunch of reasons. And probably the largest one of which is, and I encourage you to go back to the original presentations in order to look at the argument in more detail, but basically, in order to do ML, you need a lot of data. And actually a production doesn't generate enough data to give you the kind of signal that machine learning would need uh, in order to be able to successfully understand what's going on, train on data, et cetera, et cetera. So the maths doesn't really work out. 
And also a kind of a separate problem, the ROI, the return on investment for generating the model doesn't necessarily work out. Like you could use ML to, you know, 5% optimize a thing, but the cost of doing that is actually 6% of the operating budget. That actually doesn't make sense. Now, maybe some of those systems will change in size over time, or some of, the, some of those numbers will change over time and, and it'll be different. But right now, it's not great, actually. In fact, most of the time, it's just faster and cheaper to kind of do stuff. And as I say, techniques will improve. So perhaps specific tasks will get better. Um, but it certainly doesn't seem like a revolution. Now, over on the other side of the ledger, we have the strong AI ops stance. AI ops will dominate in five to 10 years or, you know, uh, two weeks from now or at the same time that Linux on the desktop arrives. You can see that kind of stance reflected in some of the claims that we went through earlier. But let me introduce a slightly more practical stance, weak AI ops. And I'll, in, in this stance, we'll say, okay, AI ops may or may not dominate in like five to 10 years, but actually today it can be really useful in ops contexts and specifically in kind of very narrow circumstances. Also, I mean, genuine point silos, uh, as we were talking about previously, may well accede to data being shared with machines, but not other teams uh, for various territory, territoriality reasons. And also, yes, sometimes it's faster and cheaper, maybe often faster and cheaper. It's faster and cheaper to do just do the statistics, but actually maybe your team, your division, your company doesn't have that expertise to hand and it's impractical to get it for whatever reason. So if the software can do the stats for you, when you can't do the stats, well, actually, that's a net gain. Okay, cool. So again, going back to how the industry seems to look at AI ops, there's a question about what its applicability is. And so I see articles claiming, okay, uh, AI ops can be used for monitoring, for alerting, anomaly detection, uh, detecting a bad change in, in the system when you push out a bad binary or uh, topically a configuration change. Uh, incident response and root cause analysis, sure, we'll use AI ops for that as well. Scaling, toil, you know, more or less everything. I'm a bit more skeptical, I think, from, from my point of view, the applicability is not necessarily formed by our particular desire to have some machine input into any of those particular pillars of activity. And it's more informed as is, I, I would claim everything in machine learning, it's informed more by the data. Do you have enough data? What is the structure of that data? What is the distribution of that data? How often do you get it? Those concerns dominate the question of the applicability of ML concerns, and also kind of secondarily, whether or not what you're trying to do is creative or requires supervision. I mean, in the machine learning case, there's a, there's a specific difference between what's called supervised and unsupervised uh, learning, where basically in supervised, the humans are kind of explicitly labeling examples, and in unsupervised, the machine attempts to just figure this out essentially by either doing those activities itself or kind of watching, uh, watching the activities take place, many, many activities. So with that in mind, I thought we would go through some of those pillars which have been identified as being maybe applicable or in scope for AI ops to do something useful and look at what kind of some SRE beliefs are about the area particularly why it might make it hard to do useful AI ops there, and then look at you know, what has to be true for AI ops uh, uh, to be relevant in this domain, and then like, play some of those tensions off against each other uh, in order to form your own thinking about uh, how, this, how this area might develop.
So I think uh, looking at the ESSERI beliefs for monitoring, alerting, anomaly detection, obviously a hugely rich area, couldn't hope to cover all of this uh, in any depth. But I think the first thing I'd say is most ESSERIs would believe that monitoring is a, a relatively dynamic thing. You find yourself changing it a lot. In my experience, a kind of bleeding edge of monitoring, you add new features, you add monitoring for those features. And so those development rates tend to go somewhat in lockstep with each other. So monitoring is a dynamic thing. It's kind of hard to train on it and with the supposition that it's static. As I say, you often discover you're not monitoring everything you need to and need to add, so add stuff. And maybe not just in metrics, but in, in rates and other kind of aggregations that incorporate those metrics. You also sometimes discover you're monitoring too much, which I don't think we ever are like, we don't really have a habit of saying in, in ESRI that we're monitoring too much. But I, I think it's Charlie Majors who says that actually dashboards over time accrete such that they have graphs relating to more or less every major outage that you've ever had in the past 10 years. And uh, ultimately the signal to noise ratio there, if just continued indefinitely, has as many problems as signal to noise in kind of standard non-observability contexts. I also say that we believe that alerting noise is solvable. There may be impediments to, solve, to solving it, but you can tune and prune and there's nothing particularly special about that. A special observation, conversely, is that, or a belief, I, I uh, suggest, is that anomaly definitions, or the definition of what is anomalous in a particular situation, can be highly context sensitive. It might well be that a 10x increase in QPS or whatever is legitimate for the situation that you're in. You've just launched a new product or someone else has just launched a new product and you don't know about it. And I think conversely on the AI ops side, uh, a lot of folks in that community would be saying, well, we don't actually need you know, to discover everything. We just need some kind of Pareto, which is to say 80-20 relationship between signals, anomalies and outages to be useful. We just have to be able to suggest that this thing might be a problem and have it be right like 80% of the time or not be wrong 20% of the time or equivalent. Or to put it another way, there's this saying in, the, in uh, medical diagnosis, which is that hoofbeats are more likely to be horses than zebras. And so this is obviously not necessarily true in the full scope of incident response, which we'll come on to in a moment, in every system. I mean, in, in some sense, sufficiently complicated distributed systems are generative grammar. They uh, give you novelty in outages all of the time, but they also give you non-novelty. AI ops might also benefit from the previous, that effect we were talking about previously, which is to say the software might have access to more data than a given subset of people do, which might mean it could join across more sources. And dashboarding, of course, is a human interface, so that doesn't have to be solved. Uh, and alert tuning, while it may well be a, an approach which solves alert noise problems, like actually maybe your team or org or whatever doesn't have the time or doesn't have the expertise in which case actually an AI ops approach might be of utility. Moving on to bad change detection, I think the, the first thing to say is that I, I don't know that I can successfully represent if there is a single ESSERI belief for bad change detection. I mean, for a significantly large or complicated community, you wouldn't ever have a, a, a unitary view, a single belief of any kind. But I, I do think that it's pretty clear that changes are genuinely a combination of a, a spectrum of risk. Some of them are really high risk, some of them less so, obviously, but they're completely necessary to do. And even if you don't do those changes, the risk gets higher if you let those changes back up and kind of accumulate. 
as is clear in the rather wonderful Accelerate book, uh, there's some pretty good evidence to suggest that, in fact, if you change things frequently with small batch sizes, that actually aids stability. I think we also have the experience that validating that a change works okay is itself potentially on a spectrum from completely manual to completely automated, depending very much on your circumstances, uh, the own, your own individual production. Even with very well supported systems within a team, there can be issues where particular systems are poorly supported for rollouts and uh, reversible rollouts and just figuring out whether or not things have gone bad in, in your rollout. And so even though rollback is the most powerful tool for addressing bad changes that we know of, it turns out that doing it actually is pretty tricky. For example, in schema changes, I mean, that's a classic example of a piece of infrastructure related to the application level change that you're making, which actually can be very hard to undo, particularly if you're doing things like adding a, a field, populating that field, and so on. I suppose that in the case of AI ops and what has to be true or, or useful for it to be involved in bad change detection, the first thing to say, obviously, is bad change detection is a distinct question from rollback. We don't need to solve rollback with, with AI ops. We just need to be useful at detection, send the signal. There is a huge movement in production uh, engineering as it is today about testing in prod. So there's one way of managing risk when you're deploying new software, which is to have different environments that more and more closely resemble what you are running in when you're running in production. And the idea is you kind of run the software in these various environments. And by the end of this, you have some statistical guarantee that you have run successfully in staging or pre-prod or whatever for some time. So you can run in production safely. The testing and prod philosophy says, actually, none of those environments ever really resemble production in a useful way. So instead, you run the thing in production and leak a small amount of production traffic into it, like a 1% sample or similar. And this allows user behavior and SLOs to be part of the decision making, which is good for AI ops, of course, because even though, for example, GitHub Copilot uh, might well help you to write tests that you could use in, in bad change detection, AI ops in, the, in, in this sense can look at the metrics and look at what happens with the customer interaction with the software can train on previous data last time you did this and so on. So these things are, are, are possible. Uh, we're not going to necessarily do them all the time, but I, I will say I think they're, they're possible and it is possible for AI ops to be useful in this domain. I think the story for instant response and root cause analysis is considerably more complicated. Again, and if you've seen my, my keynote talk, you know, I talk a little bit about this. Uh, we have a, a wide array of beliefs in the SRE community right now about these things. Uh, I think it's fair to say though, that most SREs would be skeptical. You could in any way usefully automate incident response. It's too fundamentally chaotic or creative, coming back to this point about generative grammar. Furthermore, after you have an incident, which could well be novel, the root cause or contributing factor analysis that you do to figure out what happened, I mean, particularly true in the case when it's novel, right? Uh, this root cause work is extremely complicated and it's, Primarily, I will claim here, a social activity. It's not something you're going to be able to do without uh, engaging with the humans. I, I, I don't believe that the right data is going to be exposed in a uniformly trainable way for the machine to introspect over the data and arrive at what happened. And actually, ideally, uh, root causes shouldn't recur, right? Because you put the work in to make sure that they don't happen again, or there isn't the same reason for the same outage. Of course, on the AI upside of the fence, it's a little different. In practice, 
what happens claims this viewpoint is that root causes recur all the time. And if there is enough repetition, you can train on it. If there is enough kind of precedent for this thing definitely means this other thing, and they're kind of very strongly correlated, well, ML will pick up that fact. An incident response can probably be divided into known knowns and all of the other things, specifically unknown unknowns, which is this novel category of outage that we're talking about. Again, we don't need to solve all of those things to be useful, but we just need some proportion of stuff to land in known knowns or probably unknown knowns uh, to make sensible suggestions. And it's particularly useful if, according to the paper from Jennifer Mace, if you have implemented big red button style approaches for your operations, which is to say a simple thing you can press, which will do something reasonable. Uh, the canonical example would probably be drain a cluster, i.e., you know, take traffic or input away from it in some way, uh, would make it easy for AI ops to contribute value. Coming back to this question of known knowns, unknown unknowns, um, as I say, I, I have written about this before. You can have a look at that, that uh, talk in that article in Seeking SRE. But the basic idea here is that there are risks which can either be characterized as things we're aware of or things we're not aware of. And we know how to treat them or fix them, or we don't know how to treat them or fix them. AI ops is almost certainly not applicable to unknown unknowns. It is definitely applicable to known knowns. It might also be applicable to some of the other categories in the sense that ML could potentially detect that something is happening that the humans would not have known was coming, but this could be signaled to us and we may, we may in fact be able to, to fix it. And finally, which I'll, I'll lump together, toil, um, scaling and general operations and so on. These domains are a little bit different, primarily because they don't have as wide a field of data in some cases to work on, and primarily because the emphasis is on doing things rather than kind of recommending things to humans in a system. I, I suppose that scaling is in some sense well understood today. And generally speaking, we hope it is uh, auto scaling and that we're, we're scaling as the, the traffic scales, except would we very much hope that it doesn't do auto scaling, but anyway, and it's usually easy, except when there's nonlinear effects. And sometimes those can be scaling at the upper end of capacity. Toil, of course, itself is almost by definition supremely automatable, and of course, incident response isn't. So for AI ops to be true or useful in these cases, I think a bit, bit of a more nuanced discussion. Uh, but more or less today, this is kind of a solved problem. And so AI ops is only really going to help with edge cases or things where standard kind of scaling approaches in cloud or on-prem are going to work. Uh, toil certainly automatable, uh, but I find it hard to see how AI ops could meaningfully exceed human performance here because it's kind of equivalent to the, the general programming uh, problem. And for general operations, we can trigger actions on metrics today, like in, in OODA loop style workflow engines or the equivalent. We don't need ML for this. So for AI ops to be useful here, I think we need something a fair bit more sophisticated in, in order to make this work out. In conclusion then, I'd say a couple of things. First thing is that the use definition, the, the definition that seems to make sense when, when we look at how the term is used in the industry, very much seems to be, you know, big data can help operations to which it is hard to object. And in fact, I'm sure lots of people are doing that right now. I know lots of people are doing that right now. I think one of the interesting things you see in the material written about AI ops as well is 
as well as being interesting in the case of individual contributors trying to debug questions of what's happening in production and so on, you see AI ops being talked about to help compensate for organizational dysfunction of various kinds. Those are real effects. Those dysfunctions are real effects. A lot of us struggle with them every day. I think that AI ops has some chance of helping out here. It won't obviously solve all of the issues, but I, I do think that we will find that CIOs will be sold on the possibility of using the software to address kind of longstanding organizational problems. And they will try this. I mean, they've tried everything else as well, so they might as well try this. For activities which match known known style patterns, I think AI ops approaches are plausible today. I do think also, which is something that our community has to keep in mind, is that the applicability of these techniques will improve generally over time. I think if we crack the sample size problem and get that somehow to improve dramatically, standardization improvements should also help. Unsupervised learning might well become tractable, not necessarily contingent on sample sizes, uh, improving dramatically, but just generally improving the situation to make ML more tractable on this problem domain generally. I think this will not only start, but probably gather momentum. I do think, however, that there are fundamental limits, particularly around unknown unknowns, novel situations in incident resolution, and to a certain extent, questions of cost benefit that will uh, exist even if we get better at the rest of the stuff that we were talking about in the previous bullet point. In some sense, it's a little bit like the saying which is attributed to Bruce Schneier, uh, which I think he attributes to somebody else anyway, uh, which is attacks only get better. And really that makes me think that some of our existing skepticism in the community and possibly resistance even to the idea of AI ops playing a significant role in what we do is maybe misplaced. And perhaps we have to think about maybe not necessarily complacency, but the question of where this resistance is, is coming from, how we can co-opt it, how we can maybe make some of these systems more manageable with a combination of software helping the human rather than feeding the agenda that resistance to software helping the human is so that we can end up discarding the human. I don't think that there's any real prospect of that, certainly not while unknown unknowns continue to be part of the problem, which they will indefinitely into the future. So I think that we should think about what our role is to provide the right kind of value in the context of AI ops uh, and what kind of value we provide into the future under that heading. So thank you for listening. Appreciate that very much. And I hope to talk to you soon. Bye-bye.